All right, it's, um, it's 105, so I'm just going to start first. Uh, my name is Raiden. Some of you have, may have seen me at office hours. Um, I'm currently well, I'm one of the four TAs that are helping me teach this class. And today we're going to cover Linux containers. Um, and specifically, how do Linux containers come about and how we can use them in different scenarios. So today we're going to cover uh, a couple of different, we're going to recap some privilege separation concepts. So yesterday, I believe, um, we covered privilege separation. And what are the two key concepts to privilege separation? We know that we should always employ the concept of least privilege, which basically means that you only assign the minimal set of privileges that a particular process or like a particular user requires to execute or carry out its function. And the second important concept would be segregation of duties. So commonly known as SOD. This means that, um, for example, if you are a financial controller and you approve financial transactions within a company, you shouldn't be the same person making the purchase and then you approve it yourself. There should be some segregation of duties so that you're being checked by something, right? And no two, no single principle should have too many privileges. Um, but how do we implement privilege separation in practice? Right? What, what are the technical controls we can use um, to perform such privilege separation? Um, so you might be familiar with discretionary access control, which is implemented in Unix as file permissions. For example, if I would have an executable file, it would have the executable bit set on it. Um, why is it called discretionary access control? Because the permissions on those files are determined at the user's discretion. So as long as I own the file, I can change the file permissions as and when, um, no, as to whatever I like. And that's, that's pretty much it. I can enforce further file access controls. Um, so that's DSC. How do we implement list, the least privilege? So the Linux kernel is not exactly designed um, for security. Whenever you have an application that's running on a kernel, um, you are basically exposed to all the kernel functions that are available to you. All the kernel syscalls are available for you to call. Um, so there are a couple of different technical controls. One that we're going to go through today is seccomp, which basically filters the number of syscalls, or limits the number of syscalls that you can make within a specific application. There's also capabilities, which attempts to explode root capability into different capabilities. So for example, you know, currently in Linux, root is all powerful. Capabilities aim to explode the capabilities of root, to shard it, and then assign only the capabilities that you need to run the application. So that's least privilege. And then finally, we're going to go through isolation mechanisms. So for example, if you're running a virtual machine for your lab, that's hardware-assisted virtualization. That is one form of isolation. Of course, we will go through containers, um, which is the crux, I mean, the main thing of the talk today, and how it relates to change root, namespaces, and related technologies. So I'm going to start off with three different stories of how containers might be useful, um, three different scenarios. And the first one involves Alice, right? So Alice runs a very controversial website. It could be, well, something that is very politically polarizing, and everybody wants to attack her, right? Could be a very typical LAMP stack on Linux, running Apache, running MySQL, running PHP. So she's running a couple of scripts um, that serves the website. So it might be on WordPress, for example. But her. Her website isn't exactly secure, and it gets popped like a couple of different times. And she wonders, how can she actually keep her application more, she, how can she make her application more secure? What are the security controls she can implement? So she doesn't really have a lot of money. 
She only has like one VPS, one virtual machine on Amazon. Um, but she wants to implement photo security controls um, to basically perform further privilege separation between these processes. What can she do? Any suggestions? You learned one yesterday. No one? Chain root? Chain root is one such mechanism you can employ, or in this case, Alice can employ. So through the use of a call pivot root, we can make the root file, uh, the root of the file system appear to be, or we, we can make the root of the file system to be somewhere in the middle of the file system, but it appears to the application as the absolute root um, within that space. Um, so that's the truth. But it doesn't exactly work for cases where you need to run something as root. So if I made a directory called secret, and then I execute ch root on the folder, but I'm still root, I can trivially just change the directory upwards. And once I'm outside, I call change root again on the current directory. So this is particularly problematic, because if I find a local privilege escalation exploit on perhaps uh, the Linux kernel that she's using, even if I pop the application, I'm isolated as a specific user in a ch root jail. If I manage to escalate my privileges to root, I can still escape out of this ch root jail. So not very good. I know the method would be hardware-assisted virtualization, but in this case, she doesn't really have a lot of money. It's resource intensive. You're creating a separate um, instance of an operating system, and you're going to virtualize it. You're going to have multiple kernels on, on one or two CPUs. And when you have multiple virtual machines, you have more things to patch. You have more than one operating system that's running. You have to keep all of them up to date. So that's even more work for hours. Um, not to mention VM escape vulnerabilities. And there is no virtualization for single processes, right? If you want to virtualize a single process, you basically have to create an entire spin of entire um, virtual machine just for that particular process. So that's the first story. Second story involves um, Bob. Bob is an ultra-paranoid journalist. Um, he talks with Edward Snowden. You know, he's trying to get the latest leaks. And so he's very paranoid of a lot of technologies out there because what he's dealing with is really sensitive, and a lot of people are out to get his mouth shut. He's paranoid of Google. So no Chromebooks, no Chrome OS, no Google Chrome. And he decides to just use Linux because everyone told him to. Tails is a very good operating system. That's what he heard. Um, so yeah, he decides to use Linux. But live CDs like Tails are, by definition, stale code. Because you're running, you're running code that's unpatched on a USB stick or on a live CD that's burnt. And you're using that code probably months after it was being compiled in the image. So naturally, when it comes to scenarios like these, for example, when he wants to browse the web and he's using his own physical machine, naturally, one would think that you would have to sandbox the application, right? Um, he can't use Google Chrome. So what other applications are there out there that sandbox application code? I can think of a few. Currently, there's Firefox. There's um, Adobe Reader actually sandboxes their own code. But he's still a couple of different bugs away from full system compromise, right? Even there are only so few apps that actually sandbox themselves. And is there a better solution for applications that don't natively sandbox themselves? So this is the second scenario. And the last scenario involves Kathy. Kathy is in charge of embedded security at a firm, um, some IoT company. 
So these IoT companies make small, portable routers that you can uh, deploy in your home. So it typically com composes of a web application. It has a DLNA stack. So that DLNA stacks usually have like a digital home media server. It has an FTP server. It can cast movies to a remote TV, so a couple of different proprietary protocols. And a WPA supplicant, which manages the key associations between the base station, the device itself, as well as all the different wireless clients. And if you've looked around for exploits for IoT devices, you, re you realize that they're really easy to exploit because IoT devices aren't really made with security in mind, and usually they're all running as root on one particular device. Like the web application is running as root, the supplicant is running as root, and the entire DLNA stack is just running as root, right? Because these companies don't exactly pour in enough effort and money to reinforce security for the device. And so one arbitrary code execution on the web application will lead to exploitation of the entire device. Um, and particularly for these devices, they run on architectures like ARM and MIPS. And virtualization for these devices, um, they're not really, I wouldn't say prevalent, but it's difficult. It's difficult to, to virtualize uh, for such architectures. It's difficult to segment for such devices. So what exactly can we do to, to improve the security of these devices? Um, that's a question we, we should bear in mind. So these tales, they correspond to three different scenarios. The first one is Alice with her LAMP stack. That's the server scenario when you're trying to secure a server. Second case, in the case of Bob, um, he's a desktop user. He wants to secure his desktop browsing experience, for example. And the last one is embedded systems. All these, diff these three different stories have one thing in common, is that the attack surface matters a lot. If we have a large, contiguous attack surface with only one barrier to compromising the entire system, that's not, that's not a really good model for security. We want something, we want to break up the attack surface into small pieces and we want to layer these attack surfaces so that full compromise of the system requires multiple layers, uh, breaking multiple layers, and hopefully those layers will detect um, well, unauthorized entry. So the idea between Linux containers is um, a lot of people try to compare it to hardware-assisted virtualization in the sense that you know, these days a lot of people think of virtual machines when you want to isolate something. Um, so if you spin up a virtual machine on Amazon or even if you use VMware Fusion to spin up your lab virtual machine, what you're running is actually what we call a type two hypervisor. So you have your hardware, which is in this case your laptop, and then you have your operating system. And on top of it, you run a couple of different applications as well as your hypervisor. Right? Your hypervisor runs privilege code that talks directly to the platform. Your CPU supports hardware assisted virtualization. And then on top of your hypervisor, you have your guest OS. And inside of these guest OSs, you have a full kernel. So everything is emulated inside the guest OS. Um, so you have two kernels inside of here in this diagram. That's hardware assisted virtualization. And this is called type two virtualization because there's an operating system running in the middle. So if I were to, most um, sort of user-based virtualization solutions like VMware Workstation, VMware Fusion, uh, VirtualBox, these are type two hypervisors. There are hypervisors that run directly on the hardware themselves, so that's the only thing that's running on the machine. For example, VMware ESXi. Like v Amazon wouldn't run an operating system on top of that. I mean, run a hypervisor on top of an operating system that's already there. They would just install the hypervisor directly, and they will run the guest OSs. That's, that would be called a type one hypervisor because it's running directly on the hardware itself. In our case, we are trying to create containers. So once again, it involves the platform, which is the hardware. 
And then you have the operating system on which you want to run the contagious. So. The difference is that there is no hypervisor over here. What we are actually doing is we're creating an isolated virtual environment. So all the environments will share a single kernel, which is that of the operating system. And then on top of it, we're going to have applications run inside these virtual environments. Inside these virtual environments or containers, we can install our own binaries or our own libraries as such. So it's not hardware assisted. Usually it involves a couple of different function calls at the start of the application to um, set it into this mode, and then that's it. So you get bare metal performance, almost bare metal performance, compared to hardware assisted virtualization, where, it's, uh, where some of the stuff is still being emulated, and there is a performance penalty. Um, so yeah, the idea is instead of having one CPU with many kernels, we want one CPU with a couple of different user lands. Um, think of it as like, if you're attacking a machine, so the, the, the cause, or rather the reason for why we want to containerize these kind of different applications um, in the scenarios that I've just discussed, is think about a scenario, like probably like a gunfight, maybe. You know, you are facing like a, a single gunman with seven guns. If you take down that single man, and that's it, the fight is over. But if you have seven, seven guys with seven guns, you distribute the guns, then it's, it's a much more difficult gunfight, isn't it? One attacker against seven people with guns against like one person with seven guns. Well, I'm not even sure how he's going to handle that, but um, that's one analogy I like to, to use to, to think about you know, when I'm trying to isolate different processes or different um, vulnerable applications in this instance. So again, Linux containers. Um, some people call it CH root on steroids. It's actually much more than that. There are a couple of different mechanisms that allow Linux containers to be Linux containers. The first main innovation, or the largest feature of the kernel, is called namespaces. And we'll talk more about namespaces later. Um, but it basically offers a way of isolating um, different logical groups away um, from the main operating system. That's one. Uh, I forgot to mention, container is basically a set of processes. So if you run a container, it's actually a process. It's simply just a process tree. So when it is running, it's a process. When it's not running, it is what we call a container image. And Yeah, that's it. So namespaces is one feature. Another feature that enables containers to be containers is cgroups. Uh, cgroups is a kernel feature that groups uh, functions into slices. So there's a user slice, which consists of applications uh, initiated by the user. There's a system slice, which consists of applications that um, there are like high-level system services, for example, NTP, synchronizing the time, cron jobs. The cron daemon is a high-level system, uh, system process. So that's under the system slice. And then there's um, a low-level system slice, which consists of basically processes that run um, within kernel space or are crucial to system function. And C groups allows you to, one, isolate processes. Two, limit resource usage. So you can C groups allows you to define very fine grained policies on specific processes, allowing you to define relative CPU usage, relative memory usage. So you can define a group, a C group, allocate a couple of different processes, processes to that group, define the relative usage of CPU time as well as memory space relative to other processes, or you can set the absolute 
amount of CPU time or memory or whatever resource you can think of, the, of on the computer, even device usage, you can limit that um, with C groups. So it's a very powerful tool. It is the most, is the most fine-grained tool available if you want to re limit resource usage. So this is useful in the case of, let's say, if I have a container and somebody pops a shell and decides to do a DOS attack by running a fork bomb inside um, the container, if I don't use C groups, then this will eat up all of my computing resources, right? But if I use C groups, I can limit it to perhaps 25% of my hardware resources, and all I get is a notification. I don't really get, my entire system doesn't slow down because I have C groups limiting the CPU usage of that particular process. So that's the second thing, C groups. Next thing is capabilities, which I talked a bit about earlier. Uh, capabilities is an effort to shard root privileges into many different capabilities and assigning only the ones you need. So I'll talk more about this later as well. And the last thing is limiting syscalls using seccomp bpf, which is basically a filter on what syscalls you can actually invoke from within the specific application. Uh, containers are known to be lightweight, fast. If you spin up a container, you can do it within seconds. You can attach to it, start running commands. Um, for all practical purposes, a virtual uh, a container is, it just looks like a VM. You can SSH to it, you can install packages. Um, every, most of the things that you can think of that you want to do in a VM, you could probably do it in a container. So. First order of business um, when it comes to containers is namespaces. Um, namespaces, Linux namespaces, they are a feature in the Linux kernel that basically logically groups um, certain sets of functions. So namespaces, there are a couple of different namespaces in the Linux kernel. First one is the PID namespace, which allows you to isolate on processes. There's the UTS namespace, which allow you to set a specific namespace with its own host name, its own domain name. So basically, you're assigning, you can create a space where a container has its own unique, fully qualified domain name. Sorry. There's the network namespace, which isolates um, networking within the environment. There's C group namespace. There's the IPC namespace, which isolates inter-process uh, communication, inter-process calls. And I believe that's, no, oh, there's also the user namespace, which allows, so if you have tried attaching so Linux containers within, um, within the lab, you realize that you actually have root access. But that root within the container is actually mapped to a different user ID outside of the container, and namespaces allow for that. And of course, the last one is a mount namespace. Um, so um, file system mounts within a particular isolated namespace is gonna, it's gonna appear native to the, system, the container itself and it's actually mapped outside the container thanks to namespaces. So all namespaces start, when you want to create a new process with a new namespace, it all starts with a clone call. So you can think of clone as the new fork. When you create a new uh, process with a new namespace, you're going to want to specify the flags. So if you want to create a process with a new UTS namespace, for example, you're going to specify the clone UTS flag. Clone new UTS flag. This will return you a child's process ID. And that's basically, that's, that's it. This, this is the main function call you need. There are two other uh, function calls that you can use, which are set ns to 
And there's also what's unshare. So setNS allows you to join a specific namespace. Once you're within the, once you're within the code, you want to you want to join a specific namespace that has been created. You can invoke the setNS call. Unshare allows you to create. Um, so it is similar to clone, but the analog. If you're going to use unshare to create a process with a new namespace, it's kind of analogous to doing this. And then you have your flags. So you're basically creating a new process that's, that's going to unshare in the namespace from the parent process. So these are three different um, functions that are available to you in UseLand um, to create Linux namespaces. And we're going to see how these work in action. So, so those of you at the back, can you, can you see what's going on up there? Raise your hand if you do. All right, good. So we're going to try and create a new username namespace. So here's some C code. Um, we have a child function. So this function will be invoked in the child. And what it's going to do is it's going to populate a UTS structure using the uname function. So I, I'm going to find out the host name um, inside the child process. Right? This is the function that's invoked by the child process. And then within main, I'll use the clone function to create a new namespace um, for this particular child using the flag clone new UTS. So I'm going to print out the process ID of the child. And then I give the parents, I, I make it sleep so that I give it time to switch namespaces. I'm going to print out the no name of the parent, which is basically the host name. And then the child is also going to print its note name. So we'll see how this works out. Currently, my host name is demo time. And if I compile this program, and execute it, oh, so I'm supposed to give it a new child host name. So let's call it dummy. Oh, dear. Right. In order to create a new namespace, you actually have to be sudo. So there. You can see that the child function, when it's invoked, it gives the host name that I supplied. But the host name that is being spitted out by the parent process is what, what is on the system, demo time. So that's one namespace, UTS. Um, process namespace, we can simply just go inside a container. Well, containers implement namespaces, and they have their own process namespace. So if we were to just list, I have a couple of different containers running. If I go into any one container, and I do a PS, You can see that it has its own init process, PID1. That's the parent process in any Linux, um, Linux operating system. Right. I have my own init outside as well. Oh, dear. So here, there's a root one out here. And you can see that I'm running my own init. There is a user called 100,000 that's also running init. That's because of the UID namespace mapping the UID 0 within the container to UID 100,000 outside of the container. So that's the UID namespace. Um, in the works. And if we take a look at the networking devices available, you realize that there is a bridge, LXCBR0, that's being created 
um, for these containers. And these containers are connected to this bridge through their own virtual interfaces. So what I mean by that, let me go back in. Right. Clearly my first time doing this on this machine. You can have your own ETH0. If you don't specify any networking device um, to be created within a specific container in this configuration file, the only device you get is a loopback interface. Um, but in this case, I specified a new virtual device um, to be created as ETH0. And this is how virtual machines, I'm not saying, this is how containers are going to communicate with other containers, right? You're going to isolate use all the different namespaces to isolate the specific container, and the only way it's gonna be able to communicate to other containers is through networking, or at least um, that's the setup that we have given you in the lab. So at this point, does anyone have any questions? Yes. So our C groups are a subtype of namespace, but then how come they're also within this like container so C groups is a kernel feature, right? If I were to go inside, um, so let me exit. Um, and let me just go in the root. C group. CPU. There are a couple of different um, Let's try to say different parameters I can adjust. This is a kernel feature that allows you to perform some isolation and perform limiting of resource usage, of resource allocation as well. Um, namespaces allow you to isolate the C group mechanism for that particular container. So if I were to have C groups within my host, so if I'm, I'm at demo time right now. I have my own C groups. If I enter the container, I have a separate C group mechanism with its own C group space. Does that make sense? Um, think about it as like, well, I'm gonna allocate codas for different processes on my main machine, but that doesn't affect the codas that I'm gonna allocate within the container, right? And that's what namespaces do. It performs this, this sort of isolation. Sure, I can perform it on my host machine. That's a kernel feature. But this, namespaces allow the isolation of this specific feature. Similarly for the other different namespaces. Right? Does that make more sense? Um. So the next thing I want to talk about is Capabilities. There are a couple of different capabilities that um, have been developed by kernel developers since Linux, I think, 2.6. Um, again, the goal is to shard root capabilities into many different capabilities, and then you choose the ones that you need. So certain ones are pretty intuitive, like CapNet Raw allows you, is a capability that allows you to capture network packets um, in the raw from interfaces. Um, cap set UID allows you to, well, set UID in the process, so on and so forth. So a simple example for capabilities would be the binary ping. So if I were to do a ping right here, um, ping operates on the ICMP protocol, but it requires the creation of raw packets. And the creation of raw packets is typically a root capability. But ever since capabilities was implemented, um, I can execute such binaries without having, like I can execute ping without having it to be root. Um, currently, as the capability is attached to it, but if I were to copy out the ping binary, so I believe it's in bin ping, let's copy it to 10. If I go to 10, and I execute ping, it's not going to be permitted, because I don't have the specific capability to execute that. 
So when defining capabilities on a specific file, there are three functions one can invoke. Um, you can use a shell to manipulate the capabilities. You can get the capabilities using get cap. You can set the capabilities using set cap. And in this specific instance, we want to give this ping binary the ability to create raw packets. So what I'll do is basically assign it cap net raw. It could be plus, it could be a minus, it could be equal sign. And it's going to be one of three characters, um, or a combination of the three. So I can assign it effective permissions, meaning to say that this particular capability is activated. Permitted, meaning the application code can request for this particular capability. And I for inherited meaning that this capability can be inherited by child processes. So in this case, we only want to assign effective and permitted, because that's all it needs. It doesn't need to spin up, it doesn't need to spawn a new process with such capabilities. So if I were to add the capability set cap, cap net raw plus EP to ping, so this requires root capability, obviously, and it to run it again from the current directory. There you go. So that's just one, one capability out of the many. Um, unfortunately, my, in my opinion, I think kernel developers have been getting a bit lazy and starting to lump you know, these kind of capabilities into, well, capabilities with too much um, privileges, right? Um, developers are human. They get lazy sometimes. So what you get is a capability system that is somewhat working, but is not as fine-grained as one likes it to be um, from a security perspective. But nevertheless, um, it is a powerful mechanism for you to shard root capabilities instead of just assigning a binary you know, root and giving it all the privileges um, of root. That next thing I want to cover would be setcom. Remember at the start, I talked about limiting the attack surface um, of the kernel by filtering syscalls. So how it's being done in containers is through setcom, which stands for secure computing. And initially, when SecCom was devolved, um, it only allowed you to have a couple of different syscalls. I believe there was seven or eight. And it didn't, didn't really allow you to do much um, when you invoke, uh, when you use the SecCom library. But since then, it has developed into using Berkeley packet filters, um, hence the name SecCom BPF uses Berkeley packet filters, which is basically a lightweight instruction set that is branch forward. You're going to go through the instruction set, and it's going to jump um, to failure if the syscall is not allowed. And it's going to continue down the, instructions, uh, the instructions if it's permitted. So you can think of it as like this box is failure, and this box at the end uh, allows the syscall to, to be invoked. So any of these, so it basically goes down the list of syscalls that are permitted. And then when you have a syscall that's permitted, it just jumps um, to the location of that syscall, invokes it, and then you're done. If not, it goes to the end, it fails, and it exits with a bad system call. So here I have another example. So we define a filter. So this is the Berkeley packet filter. You don't really need to know the structure of it. But we're going to allow a couple of different syscalls that we need. Right? Um, we want to be able to exit the process um, to, be, to allow the process to exit cleanly. We want, it to, we want BRK um, to be allowed as well. So this is for, I believe, uh, malloc inside libc. So we want to be able to allocate memory. We want to be able to free memory. Those are crucial. So nmap and nunmap are also important. And then because we use printf, we have write. 
Um, and for some reason, printf also requires f stats. Um, so a set comp call always starts with PRCTL. And then you set, you basically set it in filter mode. There are two different modes. There's strict mode, which is the initial version that was developed. It only allows like a couple of different syscalls. The filter mode requires you to specify a packet filter. Um, I mean a BPF, a Berkeley packet filter, which we have specified over here, allowing a couple of different syscalls. And we pass the address of it in. So this filters the, the syscalls that we can invoke from within this application. And what I'm gonna do, so I'm gonna have a print statement, well, this is hello world, but if I pass in a specific argument, it's gonna try and open a socket. Well, we didn't really allow any syscalls that allow for sockets to be binded to any port, so this should give us an error. So if I were to run So I run this application, what's gonna happen is it's just gonna print hello world, it's gonna end, right? Because it has all the syscalls it needs to function properly, nothing's gonna happen. But let's say, imagine this is an application and like I have some specific vulnerability, say a buffer overflow vulnerability, and I have shell code, like in the case of the lab, it requires you to execute on link, right? It requires you to invoke a syscall um, that's not in the list of allowed syscalls that I have over here. What's gonna happen is it's just gonna quit. So if I, if I key in the special argument, see the last line is just gonna say bad system call, and it exits. It doesn't allow you. This, this is the setcom filtering in action. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Nope. So this is one of the a few mechanisms that allow um, containers well, to to perform isolation, right? Um, and it's important because there are a lot of syscalls in the Linux kernel. Uh, currently, there's like more than 300, 300 different syscalls um, in the most current version of Linux kernel. And setcom is slowly gaining traction as like an effective way to only allowing syscalls that you need for low-level applications without, um, it allows you this level of fine-grained access control. So if we string it all together, just to recap, we have namespaces, we have capabilities, we have C groups, um, we have setcom that allows us to filter syscalls, and all these allow us to create, um, like for example in the lab, we have privileged containers. And what do I mean by privileged containers? Is that any user other than root can create containers as well. You don't have to be root in order to create a container for yourself. And these containers are isolated. For all effective purposes, they appear like a virtual machine, um, and we will see how it compares against other containerization solutions. So today we're gonna, the, the examples that we've seen over here are from a specific containerization solution called LXC. We're gonna look at how it compares to other containerization solutions like Docker, RKT, and how, in which scenario should you use containers, which scenario should you use hardware assisted virtualization. So, if we take a look at um, Linux containers, so the first thing is, when you wanna create a Linux container, you have the Linux command LXC create. And you need to specify a template. So in this case, I'm gonna use the download template. The download template basically tells um, the system to take a, a template file system and then unpack it on my local machine, and that's it. That's all it does with LXC create. It doesn't start the container yet. I'm gonna specify a name, it's gonna be demo. But what is it gonna download, right? There couple, there's so many different um, types of containers out there. I mean, so many different types of um, flavors of Linux, different releases, different architectures. So I've, I'm gonna have to specify that. In this case, I'm just gonna have the same release, the same distribution, and the same 
architecture. So because I've already downloaded it, it's going to just use the image from my local cache, but otherwise it will download from um, a server that houses these templates, I mean these images. It's going to unpack it on my local computer, and you can actually find it in .local. Slash share, slash LXC. This is where all your container lives. Well, for unprivileged containers. Um, unprivileged containers live within the user's home folder. And if I were to go into one of these folders, there is a config file. So inside this config file, I can specify further flags, further configuration entries. Um, like, for example, the ID map over here. I can change it to a different ID over here. So the root user is going to be mapped to 100,000 outside the container. On the container host, it's going to appear as 100,000. Um, this configuration is important in the events where you want to map two different user IDs to the same user ID. So you could have different containers, and I map their root users to 100,000. They will have the same UID in the container host. But I can also isolate them further and then give them separate UIDs, right? So like the root in one container maps to 100,000. The root in a second container maps to 100,001. So they, they will appear as different UIDs out in container host. Um, there are other things I can do. Uh, set, the, set the UTS name, the host name. Um, I can set a, a couple of different stuff, like capabilities. So this specific capability allows me to drop the capability net raw. If I were to save this configuration and restart, so I'm going to stop no net raw, and I'm going to start it. So the commands are pretty intuitive. LXC stop, LXC start. If you want to list the different containers you have running on your system, you just do LXC ls. If you want to see more information, it's dash. You can pass in a fancy flag, which I believe gives you the, the IP address, um, the addresses of it, and tells you whether it's unprivileged or not. To attach the container, just run LC attach and the name of the container. So when you go in, as, as some of you may see earlier, you can do anything you want um, for the most part. You can install applications um, from the repository. Um, for all practical purposes, it looks like a virtual machine, at least for, for the purposes of the lab. Um, it looks like a virtual machine. And I just removed the capability to capture raw packets, or not capture raw packets, to create raw packets. So if I were to run ping, it should give me an error. And if I remove that capability, it should work. So exit a specific container, you just exit. And if you want to know additional configuration um, parameters, flags to use, always consult the man pages. So I believe for this, it's uh, lxc.containers.conf. Oh, container. Yes. So it tells you what are different keys you can set this entire file list. Most of the stuff that you need you can specify different security profiles, logging, C groups, so on and so forth. Um, and I'll leave that for you to explore um, when, you're, when you're starting a lab too. Um, the other folder that you see inside here called rootfs is basically what's inside the container. Um, this is this is just simply the contents of the container. So if you, you just do an ls, it's the entire file system. And there are other LXC features. Like, for example, you can create a snapshot of the file system, uh, the root file system for the container. You can restore the file system um, to an earlier snapshot. You can make a checkpoint, so on and so forth. At this point, does anyone have any questions regarding the use of containers? Seems pretty easy. Well, just this is all you need for the lab. There's, we don't need 
complex configurations like seccom. I mean, these are good to know. And if you're going to deploy containers in the wild, bear these in mind. But for the lab, um, all you need to know is how to deploy, how containers are being created, how they're being started, how they're being stopped, and all these. Um, so I'm running Linux commands over here, but there is a Python interface, and we're going to be using that to basically do all these functions from within zookld.py. Um, so hopefully, this will give you a better sense of how you know, containers operate. You know, when, when you're running the script, what is, it, what is going on behind the scenes? And if you encounter any errors, you might be in a better position to, to debug and find the, the source of the error. So before that, um, I would also like to cover filtering. So remember when I talked about how processes, sorry, not processes, containers communicate with each other on the network? So when you create, when you install LXC and you create uh, containers, they're not going to be able to communicate with any other container, and they're not going to be able to communicate with the container host without the use of something what we call a network bridge. So a network bridge is basically a layer two device that bridges two different collision domains. So if I were to have a device over here, this is some local area network one, and I have some physical device or virtual device, and some MAC address, some layer two address uh, assigned to it, and a different collision domain with another device, another MAC address attached to it. A bridge is basically a device which has its own MAC address, and it's going to bridge these two collision domains. So when you type I've config in the container host and you see LXCBR0, that's the default network bridge that's being created by LXC um, in order to facilitate intercontainer uh, inter communication. Um, that's one thing. But what if we wanted to further lock down communication, right? Because a network bridge allows for all traffic to pass through. There is no access control over here. Um, it operates a layer two of the OSI model. So you're just basically creating one large collision domain for all the different containers that are attached to this specific bridge. How can we further limit, uh, inter, or rather uh, control what, which containers can talk to which other containers, and perhaps more fine-grained, in a more fine-grained manner, which ports, uh, which IP addresses, so on and so forth. And this can be done directly from the Linux kernel. So there's a specific kernel feature. It's called NetFilter. And it is more commonly referred to as IP tables because that's the tool set that's being used to manage NetFilter. So again, root. So IP tables is, think of it as the firewalling solution for, for Linux. Um, so there are a couple of different moving parts when it comes to IP tables. Um, there are three main com components of IP tables. The first thing is that there's tables. And I'll explain what these are in a moment. You have tables. You have chains. And you have targets. So for tables, there are five main tables. Raw, security, filter, mangle, and net, which stands for Network Address Translation. These two, you won't, for most use cases, you will never use these two tables. Um, filter is the main table that you want to use. 
Filter basically processes incoming packets or outgoing packets and determines what it should do um, based on a rule set that you've configured. Mangle allows you to edit um, packets. Network address translation, well, intuitively does network address translation for you, as we will see in, in an example that I, I will demonstrate. Chains is the input chain, is the output chain, is the forward chain, is the pre-routing chain, That's the post routing chain. So all these might seem all over the place now, but I'll draw a diagram that ties all of this together. So you have tables, and tables consist of chains. So the filter table consists of input, output, and forward. The mangle table consists of inputs, no, all five tables. And NAT consists of pre routing post-routing, and I believe forward. So tables have chains. And when you traverse the chains, each of these chains have specific rules, right? So you have, perhaps you have a rule on, in the filter table in the input chain that says, if I have a packet coming in from this particular IP address that's going to this destination port, I want to allow it. And then I want to deny everything else. So the action to allow or to deny is a target. So you have a couple of different targets. You have accept, you have deny, oh no, sorry, you have reject, and you have drop. So these are the main targets um, that you will use. A chain can also be a target, hence the name chains. So I can define my own custom chain have a couple of different rules within that chain, and then set that particular rule, for example, an input, to go to that, um, the target to be the custom chain that I've created, and then it will evaluate those for the rules. Um. So, I have my network and I have packets coming in. How, in which order do these chains slash tables um, get evaluated? The first one would be the NAT table, and it's going to be the pre-routing chain. Right. So let's say if I have, if I have a, a, a container, a container host, and I have a container that's running a web server, I want to forward it to this particular web server. Well, let's say even if you're, you're running Minecraft, right? You, you're running a Minecraft server on your laptop, but somehow your friend cannot connect to your IP address because maybe you ran your Minecraft in a virtual machine. And well, you, the Minecraft port isn't exactly exposed um, to the same network as your friend is on the MIT network. So in a way, this is what we call port forwarding, and a pre-routing chain allows you to um, change, sort of like forward it to an inner destination, as we will see later. At this point, it's going to perform a routing decision. So the routing decision is going to decide whether, you know, is this packet going to continue throughout the entire chain, right? And if it's on the current system, it's like if it is one of the few address spaces within the system. For example, if I want to forward it to um, this particular IP address, 10.0.1.1, if 10.0.1.1, like .1.0 slash 24, is one of the few entries in my routing table within my system, then I'll just send it to that particular interface. Otherwise, Sorry, if it's local to the interface. If it is local to the interface, it basically sends it to the input chain. Otherwise, it sends it to the forward chain. So the forward chain is going to decide whether um, can this packet be forwarded. It's going to go through all the different rules within forward 
and it's going to see whether you can send it um, to whatever destination you want to send it to. So just to make sure I'm getting this right, I'm doing it off of memory. Um, So after a routing decision is made, it's going to be sent to the input chain, which thereafter, it's going to be sent to a local process. So at this point, this is going to be something like a web server. It's going to parse the incoming packet that's coming in from the network. And then a routing decision, it sends. This is going to go to the NAT table output. And then it's going to go to the filter table output. And then finally, a routing decision is made. It goes out to the NAT table post routing chain. So functions like um, address masquerading, so on and so forth, are done in the post routing chain. And after it's done, it goes back out in the network. So this is a very simplified diagram. I've left out a couple of different chains, a couple of different tables, because for all practical purposes, this is the diagram that you need to refer to when you're wondering how does your packet traverse the, the net filter chains and tables, and, and um, how, in which order are they being processed. So I have a couple of different virtual um, I keep saying virtual machines. I have a different couple of different containers right here. I have a container that runs a database server, uh, a MySQL database server, to be precise, and a web server. So I'm just going to go in a web server first. Uh, and it basically has a PHP script. Which, initially, uh, which initiates a connection to the MySQL database server. And if it is able to connect to it, it prints out a success message. If it doesn't, it well dies with uh, an error message. So currently in my web um, container, I have nothing specified in IP tables. And in my database um, container, let me just open it in a terminal. So I have to keep switching. Everything's empty. So if you see the output of IP table slash L, which basically lists um, the different chains associated with, if you don't specify a table, by default, it's filtered. So if I were to do IP table slash filter, it gives dash T filter, dash L, it gives you the same output. If I specify the table, like an AT, it gives you extra chains, pre-routing, input, output, and post-routing. Um, by default, all the policies of these chains are set to accept, um, which is not exactly a good security practice, because if you have a couple of different, you, you're going to evaluate the rules within the chain, and if none of them match, you just allow them anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to lock down this database server, and we're only going to allow connections from the web server to the database server only to the specific ports. So that's the logical diagram for how a packet flows through IP tables. But if we were to look at the interface level, so I have an interface over here. Before a packet is going in to the interface, it's going to be evaluated by it's going to traverse the pre routing chain. And before it's exiting, it's going to be post routing chain. So that's like when it enters and it exits the network. So it's evaluated before it exits the network. And then before it's being sent to a local process, it's going to be evaluated by the filter table input chain. Um, these chains are separate. So the filter table has an input chain. The NAT table has another input chain. And what we want to do is to filter packets. So we're going to use the filter table 
the input chain. And the input chain is going to allow us to specify which source, which destination, IP address and ports, and what action to take. So I want to allow the web server to connect. So I'm going to append. Remember, if I don't specify a table, it's going to be, by default, the filter table. So I'm going to specify that I want to append to the input chain. And then the source address is going to be that of here, 10.0.69.176. And I only want connections to the database server. right? If I have maybe SSH running, I don't want other people to see that. So MySQL runs on TCP at layer 4, and the port is 3306. So I'm going to specify the protocol, which is TCP. The destination port is 3306. And what do I want to do with it? I want it to accept. So at this point, let's just verify that this file still runs. And when I visit uh, the web server and I execute the script, it connects successfully. If I do, uh, and now I'm going to change the policy for the input chain over here to drop. So this P specifies the policy for the chain, which is by default, what action is it going to take when no rules in the chain match? It just still connects successfully because maybe not. Sometimes it takes a while to, yes, it does. Well, the reason why it's a bit slow is because um, when you initiate a connection to a server or, or a specific process, usually a couple of different packets are being exchanged, right? It's, it's like if you're connecting to a database server, you're going to talk, you're going to speak multiple times with the server. It's not, just, it's not a stateless protocol like HTTP. You send a request and you get something back. Um, so these packets, we can keep track of the connection state. And if it is part of an earlier related connection, like we only evaluate the first connection to the server, if that is valid, then all subsequent related connections are also valid. So we will see later how to add such rules inside. But for now, it works. Um, I'm able to, the web server is able to connect to the database server. So now I'm going to go into the web server. And this is a web server, so I don't want anyone looking at any other ports other than 80. So I just IP tables, dash A, input, dash J, accept. Well, before that, I'm going to specify TCP. I'm only going to allow destination port 80. I don't care who. It's going to J, accept. So this is the target. And then I want to do IP tables, dash P, input, drop. Because, well, what's the difference between drop and reject, you might say? Well, reject sends a message back to the originator saying, well, your packets have been rejected. Well, drop is silent. It doesn't do anything. So um, usually that is preferred to reject. Because if you use reject, and usually if someone's port scanning you, you can determine if, you know, you can determine that there's a firewall in the middle rejecting your packets, right? If it's dropped, maybe there's nothing listening at that port. Um, so the lesser information, the better. If I were to refresh this page, I should get similar results. Oh. oh boy. It's taking too much time. I can just verify that it's not the rules. So I only allowed three seconds for it to connect, and currently it's taking longer than usual. But for the purposes of this demo, we just assume that it probably connects to the web server. Uh, connects, uh, we can connect to a web server, and a web server connects to the database server, and everything's working well. Um, but currently, the addresses over here are only local to the container as well as the container host. What if I have? What if I want to access this web application outside of my container host, right? So in this case, I want to perform port forwarding. And if I want to do port forwarding, I want to do it on the container host. Because the container host has, sorry, you have a question? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so on the web, um, rather than the database, so on the web container, do you have to uh, have a, um, a rule to allow uh, getting packets back from the database? Uh, yes. So you, you like right there. You said okay, drop everything is like your default policy, yeah. and then allow incoming HTTP connections like port 80. Yes. But you didn't do any, a rule that allows uh, you know the database to send information back. Do you not need that because it's clever enough to know that <laughs> hey, this is already an established connection that I established outbound, and therefore any traffic coming back in from that same you know, external place is yeah. good to go through. Well, usually if you have two different applications talk to, uh, to, to one another, you know the ports they're going to talk to, right? For an application like a web server, you're going to initiate from some high-level port like 54321, and that port can change any time. So if you want to specify a destination port with such fine-grained access control, um, it's not really practical um, in this case. So usually we limit the amount of incoming connections, and we assume that, you know, everything that's originating from my web server is like, is good to go. Like, uh, there are a couple of different um, scenarios in which this might not be that good. Like, for example, if my system were compromised and someone were to have a connect back shell, right? It's going to come connect back out. Um, well, it all depends on the level of risk that you're willing to accept. Um, if you really want to lock down server, sure, you can specify the upper chain and only restrict it to certain types of connections. Um, you, you could have. You have additional layers that only say, you know, these, like for example, use capabilities to specify that only these applications are allowed to use perhaps the network, create, create raw packets, so on and so forth. So there are other control mechanisms that allow you to lock down um, packets going out. Um, and usually the output chain is reserved for um, two different applications, for example, server applications. Let's say I have an iSCSI mount, I want to mount like a remote file system. I know the port. I know it's going to connect to this port. Um, that in that case, I specify in the output chain. But usually, um, in scenarios like web servers, where it's going to connect to some random port, to some random host, to send information back, we don't specify anything in the output chain. Does that make sense? Well, so then, yeah. so then, honestly, the connections that you establish, so like I send a packet first, any response packet yes. will not go through the table. Um, it will it will go through the table. So how do I, I actually didn't do that? But let's do it now since um, it's your last. So if I want to allow established connections, what I do is well, established connections will go through the input chain, right? Pre-routing is basically for mostly for port forwarding, and the input chain is where I'll evaluate the rules and see you know whether it's part of established connection. And what to do is I'm going to append it to input chain. I'm going to make use of a module. It's the state module, and this is going to keep track. It's a contract module that will keep track of the connections that are coming in. And then I want to specify the state, right? So the state for these packets should be established related, and I want it to accept. So that's all. And of course, um, oh, it should be the first entry. This is usually the first entry of um, input. So I just delete input two. A accept, no. Input dash p tcp dash dash d port eighty dash j accept. This is how it usually looks like. So the first line accepts all established and related connections, and the connections that are allowed to be established <coughs> is specified by the second line. Does this make sense? If you have any questions, you, you can approach me after this lecture. Um, so yeah, back to back to pre-routing and port forwarding. If I want to do that, well, same thing over here. I'm going to just drop the root first, and I'm going to allow. Um, so this time I want to touch the NAT table, and I want to append to the pre-routing chain. I'm going to specify that I'm only going to look at packets. Which are operating, um, which are using TCP, with the destination port of 80, because that's that's the port that my web server is going to be running, and then the destination is going to be my own interface, right, of the container host. So in this case, I believe that's my IP address. Oh, here. 
So it's going to come into this interface. So that's the destination. And I want it to make it jump to the target DNet. I want it to forward it to a destination, which is specified here. And I want to specify that destination as my container web. So if I were to go into web and then see the IP address over here, 176. So you can key in a host name, just that it's going to resolve. IP tables will actually resolve the host name. So I can put like dash s google.com and like all packets from google.com. It will be resolved to whatever IP addresses you have, and then it will evaluate the rules. So that's one. And see, rule is inside. So if I were to go into my Mac, so I'm currently in my Mac. I want to connect to my virtual machine. It should link me to that page. Because what it does, it, it comes into my, well, I'm browsing from a Mac. It goes into my virtual machine because I'm connecting to 192.168.162.138. And that's going to forward those packets that are going to port 80 to the specific container that is running. And that's how the request is being port forwarded. Of course, if you're actually on, let's say you're deploying like an enterprise class firewall, usually they have rules that determine you know, what, what packets can be forwarded. Right? So for example, if I have a firewall and I have a couple of different systems behind this firewall, I want to forward like, packets from the web server to um, the web server that's behind the firewall. Uh, I want to forward web requests to the web server that's behind the firewall. Um, the pre-routing chain only allows you to forward it to destination, but it doesn't allow you to actually check if such a such forwarding is allowed. Such forwarding is actually controlled by the forward chain. And by default, the policy is accept. So if I were to set the policy for forward to drop, I shouldn't be able to connect. It should fail. If I want to allow such packets to be forwarded, the first thing I need to do is to also allow, once again, establish related connections. And then I want to allow TCP port 80 connections to the specific web server that I've created, which is 176, I believe. And this is all in the filter table. Yeah, so it connects. So that's basically a primer on how NetFilter and IP tables works. Um, when in doubt, always refer to the diagram. And that basically tells you how packets flow through NetFilter. And so in the lab, you actually deal with a small example. You'll, deal, you'll configure a couple of different IP tables, like rules, um, within the configuration files that uh, you have provided. So I have a couple of minutes left. Um, we're going to go through it, like how secure containers are for different use cases. So we have a couple of different threat models that we can look at. The first thing would be applications, right? regular applications. So these applications, by definition, they execute arbitrary code. Like, for example, your HTTPD, MySQL, so on and so forth. What could go wrong? Anyone? The lab? What happens to the web server? Get compromised. Gets compromised, right? Through a buffer overflow. So you can execute arbitrary code, but there's nothing you can do because it's just code, right? It's, well, I mean, there are a couple of different mitigations that you can perform, um, but we're not talking about application level mitigations. We're just talking about containers. So what can you do? Nothing much. Well. Um, if it breaks out in, of the application, so if you exploit, for example, an HTTP server, you get a shell, you get root in the container, for example. But because of namespaces, you get mapped to a UID of 100,000 outside. So 
So you can't really escape. Um, however, let's say you have a further level of access control. You have Unix permissions, and you put HTTPD to be some user, like HTTP. Well, what if I find some local privilege escalation exploit? For example, um, SUID binaries, which allow me to execute as a root user. Same thing. I'm still isolated by the container because of username spaces. Um, I can execute kernel code. I can, uh, no, I can invoke syscalls, right? But seccom limits that. So that's covered. Um, it's very difficult to leak from, for me to leak to another container because I can specify the UID mapping. So one container can be 100,000, and another container can be 100,001. And these two user IDs don't really have privileges to, in order for these processes to, to touch each other. Um, so that's one. Regular applications. There are system, high-level system services. For example, you have um, SSH, cron, syslog. Syslog, NTPD. Usually, these applications don't need to run as root, but certain Linux flavors actually still let these processes run as root. Well, for cron, in the specific case of cron, you're going to run a root cron job. Obviously, you need root, but in most cases, user-based cron, you don't need root to execute. Um, so there's a risk of running arbitrary codes, in which case, if you have a specific sensitive service, like if you have SSHD, you should isolate it in a virtual machine or like in a, in a container in this case. Um, you can mess with devices in slash dev, but we have namespaces for C groups, so you can control accesses to devices by using C groups to isolate them. What else could go wrong? We could, we, could, we could use root calls, right? Because usually, some of, some of these processes run as root. What else can we do? We can do everything that root does, but we can also limit them using capabilities. We only assign the binaries the, the privileges they need without breaking the binary because it requires like certain root privileges, but we limit it to the set of capabilities that actually need to run. So even though they have root, they only have the capabilities that they need uh, to execute the function. And once again, leaking with UID 0 is, is protected um, through the use of user namespaces, because you're mapping it to an unprivileged user outside. Um, as for low-level system services, you have stuff like um, device management. IP tables is a low-level system service. A file system mounts. You're able to run arbitrary code with full privileges, right? In that case, because it sits very close to the kernel. In fact, it might be a kernel module. Um, if that is compromised, then that's pretty much game over. Um, of course, there are other access control mechanisms like SE Linux, um, which allows you to enforce mandatory access control. If you're interested, you can read up more on that. But in general, for low-level system services, we, do, we should treat them as if they're part of the kernel. Um, that's good practice. But what happens to kernel applications then? Well, if you want to protect or containerize kernel applications, that's really a bad idea because in the container model, we're going to have a shared kernel, right? So in that case, containers aren't really good for kernel applications. You're going to have to use hardware-assisted virtualization because it's going to need its own separate kernel. Um, and containers are not going to make um, kernel line application secure. So don't, you know, in a way, safely shoot yourself in the foot because it's not, containers are not going to protect applications in that, um, in that use case. Yeah. So I hope I've given you like, a good primer to Linux containers today. And if you have any further questions, I'd be happy to take them right here after the lecture. I mean, just like now. <laughs>